Hello and welcome to episode 56 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I'm one of the co-founders here at ETR. I hope you are all healthy and well in your respective quarantines. Today, we have a very special guest. This is a young man who rose to power with ridiculous success as a teenager in the poker streets. He's well known in the crypto space. He's on the other side of the counter taking action now. He's our friend from north of the border. It is Mike McDonald, a.k.a. Timex. Mike, how's it going? Uh, it's going good. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on the pod. And, it's, uh, and thanks for calling me young. I turned uh, 30 recently, and, you know, any I get ID'd or anything, it's always uh, it's a nice compliment. Yeah, good for you. Welcome to the 30s. Enjoy yourself. Oh. Uh, I think before we get to your 30s or your 20s, there's a lot of people listening, a lot of DFS people, because when we're going to get to this, why you haven't been in the DFS streets, it's egregious, but uh, uh, we're going to get to that. But a lot of DFS people may not even know the whole backstory here. Uh, what were you doing before poker and how did you find poker? Because for those that don't know, Mike, uh, I guess first came to popularity by winning an EPT, I think it was like 2008 for like 1.3 million, I believe at the age of 18, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, Mike. Yeah, so I guess uh, what I was doing before that I guess would have been high school, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> so, so, you know, for, for me, I, uh, I used to play uh, chess competitively when I was a kid, I wasn't very good or anything. Um, but, you know, I always liked playing games. And at one point, you know, I think my, my chess coach, he had made something like two grand playing online poker, which like for a chess player is pretty damn good when there's, there's no real money in that. And the one day we were just bored at chess lessons and he was just like, uh, hey, you know, you want to learn some of the basics of poker? I think I was, you know, uh, 14, about to turn 15 at the time. And, you know, we were watching, you know, Spirit Rock playing on Ultimate Bet. And he was kind of commenting mm -hmm. on, you know, the moves he was making and, you know, stuff like that. And I just thought it was an interesting game. I knew I was never going to make any money with chess. But, you know, just kind of thought this was interesting, thought it was cool that, you know, he's only been playing poker for four months or something. And he's making more money than he does with chess. And, you know, I just thought, you know, seemed pretty cool, bought some books, you know, I'm a pretty mathematical guy and think I had a bit more of a knack for poker than I did for chess. And yeah, just kind of started playing for pennies and then nickels and that, you know, and just kind of, you know, worked my way up. And then, you know, I went to, I went and did first year university, just kind of knowing that uh, once I was old enough to play these live tournaments, I was going to drop out or I, I told my parents to take a year off. And, you know, if, it, if the year went horrendously, probably go back to school and anything else just kind of wanted to stick with it where, you know, I, I wasn't really that passionate about my schooling um, and I was enjoying this so much. And then, you know, I was pretty fortunate that, you know, five months into that, I, you know, won, won uh, the German championships and yeah, never really looked back. Um, you were born and raised in Waterloo or you just lived in Waterloo? Because people who know poker know there's been just a ton of people who've had success coming out of Waterloo. And I think it makes sense because I believe it's like one of the best math-based colleges slash universities in Canada is in Waterloo. But is that where you're actually from? Uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's where I'm from. Um, and yeah, most of the Waterloo poker players just kind of did their undergrad here. And, you know, I might even go so far as to say it's one of the best kind of, you know, math CS schools in the world where it's, it's pretty clear number one in Canada. And it's, there's a little bit of a thing where you know, when it, when it comes to go at trying to apply to Ivy League schools, you know, Americans compete against Americans, competing against non-Americans. So it's so, it's so competitive when there are so many like genius mathematicians out of China that basically no Canadians ever get into the good American schools for their undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, so they all kind of come to Waterloo. So it, there's, there's definitely a bit of like a, almost like a congregation at that school. It's not to say that there, it, it's totally filled with geniuses or anything, but the, the technical programs have a very high, uh, you know, concentration where pretty much, yeah, all the, you know, math whiz kids in, in Canada go to that, go to that one school and they kind of do their undergrad there and then go to American grad schools is, is kind of the, the model, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So how long were you playing poker as your sole focus for? Because obviously Black Friday comes, it doesn't affect people in Canada as much, but I think it did affect the games to some degree. To some degree. How long were you playing poker uh, super seriously for? So, sorry, before, before that tournament or before? Or before at what, going so, forward. Yeah, going forward after the tournament. Yeah. So I guess, I mean, I guess, yeah, played poker pretty seriously until sort of mid-2016, I suppose. You know, that was, that was, you know, so I, Played my first hand of poker late 2014, 
kind of, you know, started playing in the, you know, big, uh, big tournaments. Late 2004, late 2004, you mean? Yeah, sorry, late 2004, started playing in the big live tournaments, late 2007, and kind of stopped playing in the big live tournaments kind of mid-2016. Yeah, okay. Uh, you became, I guess, infamous or, or famous or noted for this whole Bank of Timex thing. Explain to the people what Bank of Timex is, why you started doing it, uh, what, it what Bank of Timex means. Yeah, so um, basically there was, there was an era kind of uh, early 2010s, mid 2010s, where uh, people would sell uh, sell action to tournaments at a premium. And you know, the, the, the simple model for this is you play a thousand dollar tournament, you know, someone can give you 10% of the buy-in for 10% of your winnings. They put up a hundred bucks, they get 10% of what you win. Well, then people, you know, invented this concept of markup where you charge a premium, you know, maybe you charge a 20% markup. So you pay, uh, you know, $120 for 10% of what you win. And, you know, I think this, this sort of ran a little out of control, I think, where people who made winning investments kind of kept getting excited about them and made more investments and people who made losing investments, well, they kind of disappeared into the shadows and you never really heard about the losers. And then the players that were most talented and most successful never really needed investors. And you kind of ended up in this thing where the guys that after years and years of doing this, just kind of, if you still needed investment, you in a lot of situations weren't the ultra elite players. And also a lot of, if an ultra elite player was still seeking investment, it's often because they knew they could charge such a large premium that it's more than they're worth. Perhaps you charge a 40% premium when you're only winning 20% kind of thing. So that was, so, you know, this is one of those things where, you know, kind of me being a bit of a hater who always, you know, I like, I like how much poker can be a meritocracy and it's just the good players win, the bad players lose. I, I kind of, you know, I like that part of the ecosystem. These kind of bad players who are selling at too large of premiums, it just kind of irked me, you know, rather than, rather than focus on your game, focus on improving, focus on understanding how to beat your opponents, you just focus on how to market yourself and how to, you know, trick investors and use, use your good reputation to get people to overpay. And it just, you know, it just irked me. So, you know, at one point I made this uh, Twitter account to just kind of troll people and say, this guy's charging you know, I think this guy's winning 20%. He's charging a 40% premium. Okay. You know, make a derivatives market where I'll charge a 30% premium. And, you know, rather than owning a true percent of him, I kind of invent a percent of him where you pay me and then I pay you out of pocket. And, you know, so I came up with this idea and it was just kind of a joke thing and people thought it was funny. And, you know, at one point, um, at one point someone reached out to me and just said, you know, have you ever thought about, you know, trying to turn that into a real business? And, mm -hmm. You know, I was like, ah, that seems like a lot of headache. You need to go get a gaming license, got to set up a company, all this work with lawyers. You know, it just, it just seemed like such a headache. He's like, well, why don't you do it? And I'm, I'm, I just said, I don't really want to do that. And he said, okay, if I, do, if I do all the annoying work and you just kind of, you know, you know set odds, market it, et cetera, would you want to go and, you know, be partners with that? And, you know, that seemed like a good, uh, good situation for me where, you know, he does all the real work and I, you know, uh, focus on the fun stuff, I suppose. And that was kind of, that was kind of how, uh, how poker shares came about. Okay. Yeah. We're gonna get to poker shares in a second though, but yeah, I, I totally agree that, um, people overconfident are overconfident in their ability to play poker, to play DFS, to, uh, be on team sex. Like people like guys are just like, so overrate their abilities and everything. And I agree with you that, uh, people aren't winning at the rate that they're charging in markup. And also we've seen this in DFS. I mean, there's been an explosion of people arguing about what people's markup should be. However, there is some market, there's some thing to be said, I think for it's a free market. And if somebody wants to pay 2.0 for Phil Hellmuth, then that's the market rate. And if somebody's willing to pay it, then it is what it is. If I say my house is worth $2 million, even though it's only worth 500,000, well, if one person is willing to pay it, then that's the market. What do you say to people who say, hey, uh, people should be able to charge whatever they want. Why are you getting pissed off? Yeah, I mean, so I think that originally I was just the guy getting pissed off. And then as, as I've matured more, I, I kind of agree with the market. You know, if you, it's not, um, you know, if you go into any store and buy anything, you know, what a, a, you know, you go buy a t-shirt or something, it's not as if the, you know, $17 t-shirt you just bought cost that company $17, you know, it's not as if you could come in with that same t-shirt and say, Hey, I'll sell it to you for 16. If you think it's worth 17, you know, it's just that that's, you know, nothing is, is really a true market and i think that you know the it's this kind of seemed like one of those if you can't beat them join them type things so if you're unhappy with the market 
you know, just kind of add to the market, you know, Phil Hamid is selling at 2.0. Okay. We'll sell them at 1.9 kind of thing. So, so mm -hmm. that's, that was kind of the mentality there where, you know, I agree that there's, there's a lot of different, and I think that uh, poker and DFS may lack too many of those. And, you know, that was just kind of us doing our part to, um, to kind of regulate that, I suppose. Um, okay. I want to talk about poker shares because it's fascinating to me, like here in the United States, it's so regulated. Like you can't even put up a market on who will be the next president, let alone poker matches or poker tournaments or push-ups. But apparently in Canada uh, or wherever else uh, poker shares is operating, you can make a market on anything. Is that right? And, and, and why, I guess? Yeah. So poker shares is based on Curacao. And, you know, Curacao would be one of the more popular places to have a gaming license. And it would be one of the ones where it's kind of, you know, on the kind of tiers of gaming licenses, it's probably kind of, you know, a tier three type license where, you know, on the one hand, it has um, less regulation, but on the other hand, it has less opportunity. Generally, kind of the more regulation you have, the more kind of opportunity you have. You know, if you want to be able to put commercials on TV, you want to be able to do Facebook advertising, you often will need a higher tier of license, which then comes along with, you know, more stringent rules. Um, so basically, and then different, different countries accept different licenses. So, you know, there's, you know, two dozen countries, which we don't operate in or so. Um, and yeah, so, you know, basically the, yeah, the, the kind of rule, the rules in Curacao would be uh, more flexible than America. I think America would be one of the uh, strictest countries when it comes to gambling. Okay, so the main markets that you guys have are typically around poker. I'm curious how much action you get on, you know, uh, I don't know, who's going to win the Sunday Million on Stars or, or whatever, um, versus something like Bale's push-up bet, which I know you put up uh, a market on and tried to undercut some of the juice that was being laid by some of the uh, more unregulated uh, offshore stuff so i'm curious where the action is and, and how much action you can get on on kind of poker and, and politics and push-ups and stuff like that yeah so i i guess the the answer i would say is that it all depends you know it definitely um you know it kind of, i think it sort of depends on you know factors within the poker economy factors within sort of the world economy you know there's there's a lot of different things where you know just sometimes will some tournament will get 10 times as much action as that same tournament got last year kind of thing. And sometimes it'll be one tenth of the action. So, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of kind of uncertainty surrounding these things. Um, the one thing I will say, and it's, you know, it's kind of, you know, when I say it, it almost, you know, it's almost stupid that it took us this long to realize, but you know, the traditional sports betting market, it, there's a reason that it's what everyone uses. You know, it's, it, it's say, you know, let's say the, um, you know, the Lakers are playing against Golden State or, you know, something, you know, something gold this year. Uh, you know, Lakers are playing against Golden State this year. Very few people, you know, probably when people, whatever that was, 200 years ago or longer, they would be, they would say, okay, here are the odds on Lakers winning, here are the odds on Golden State winning. And after enough time, they realized, hey, you know, the, the Lakers are almost always going to win. Golden State's almost always going to lose. Okay, this is, this is not that fun of a bet you know, let's start, you know, trying to, you know, either bet over unders or, you know, mm -hmm. add a set number of points such that it's about a 50, 50 bet. And, you know, people, I think they, they like things that can roughly double or triple their money. They don't like things that, you know, sure things that increase their money by 10%. They don't like long shots that never win that, you know, that 10 X their money or hundred X their money. So trying to invent, trying to invent markets that, are fairly even. So, you know, mm -hmm. with, with poker shares, as an example, you, you join a tournament, you know, so first of all, you, you lose about 80, 85% of the time. Second of all, when you do win, you often just double or triple your money. And then, you know, when you win the whole tournament, you get a hundred X or something. And just kind of right. the user experience there of put a hundred dollars online, lose it, put a hundred dollars online, lose it, you know, put a hundred dollars online, turn it into you know, 5k cash out 3k, and then lose 100, lose 100, lose 100. Well, at the end of the day, you, you made, you know, $2,700, but it feels like it was mostly losing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so, you know, with the, with bets that are kind of more 50 50, you know, things like the Bills push a bet, things like who's going to be the next president, things like this Phil Galfon challenge, you know, the Phil Galfon challenge right now, 
might be more than 50% of our total volume for the year. Uh, it's, it's, been, it's been crazy, especially when it's been so back and forth. Um, and everybody has such strong opinions on this. Um, and so that, you know, it's one of those things where we were adding the Fell Gelfon Challenge. We were thinking, oh, you know, like we might do, you know, we might do some, you know, decent amount of volume, maybe make a little bit of money. And then pretty quickly, it was, it was like the whole world, you know, the whole poker world got obsessed with these things. And, and people, you know, are interested in both sides with such huge volume. And yeah, that, you know, so seeing things like that has kind of, you know, uh, made us more realize, hey, there's, there's a reason that we're able to have a monopoly in this space. And that's just that the market for other, um, other things within this industry, you know, more traditional uh, forms of sports betting are just way more popular. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, while we do, uh, while we do quite decent volume on our poker events, you know, we're sort of realizing, you know, the, these prop bets and other challenges and just things where, you know, everyone has a sweat at roughly 50, 50 is kind of more engaging to the user. Yeah. Uh, we got a question from, uh, Evan Silva. You guys might know him friend of the show. He says, does Mike know where the bright idea to get a, to bet against Bales originated? I mean, I assume you took some action against Bales. I know, I know you were among the higher on side of the lines. At one point, I think you had to lay like minus 233 to bet on Bales to do it. But I assume you got some action on the other side. Where, what were these people thinking that were betting against Bales? I don't know. I feel like, I feel like people that were fading Bales just haven't seen what Bales looks like. You know, the guy's <laughs> jack, the guy's jacked as fuck. You know, I would like, I would like, I know originally someone was, someone uh, hypothesized the bet of, you know, getting paid $5 a push up or something like that. I wonder what Bales would have done. You know, I, I'm not sure, but you know, when I was watching that, seeing him, you know, on his last set, he reps out 20. I think he could have repped out 40 on his last set. And you know, it's see, I, I think the dude was ready to do, you know, 3,700 or something like that. You know, it felt, it felt to me that, uh, I don't know. I just, I think I've heard of in the past of him doing, you know, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think I saw one or two, um, fitness related things pertaining to bales. And I just thought, you know, so I just thought, Hey, one, this guy is fucking jacked and in good shape. And two, I also think, um, I think when, when these bets come up, the, the, this is very much feel player logic, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, rather than try to think about the task at hand and think, okay, what are the chances someone completes the task at hand? I think it's almost better to think, okay, you know, what's, what's the narrative surrounding this? And, you know, I think, I think you look, I think you look at Bales and, you know, the, the first thing that kind of comes to mind, and I, I don't know Bales inside and out, so some things I say might be wrong. It doesn't really seem like he's a gambler. You know, he's someone who is, you know, early on on DFS, and then rather than try to, you know, try to churn money with with risk, it was, you know, write books, build businesses, and just kind of take the, the zero risk approach, which might be, it, it could be lower upside, but it's definitely lower volatility. And, you know, when a guy like that is betting on himself, and, you know, it just seems like the type of guy who's going to win. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. if, if, you know, there's some people who always go out on the line with crazy opinions and, are often wrong but he just seems he just seems like a pretty stable guy who would usually win so even without knowing even without knowing the task if it you know he just he just seems like the type of guy who's going to win his bets kind of thing so that was you know that that's another kind of factor at play where i'm just you know i'm just trying to trying to before the competition competition starts i'm just trying to picture okay we're 48 hours from now like envisioning the universes where bales loses and looks <laughs> stupid and then envisioning the universes where he wins and then you think oh yeah dude's jacked as fuck and doesn't really doesn't really take the worst of it a lot you know so it just it just seemed you know rather than trying to think okay that's so many per hour just trying to think of i don't know this this just seems like a dude who's gonna win his bet kind of thing so to, and then back to evan's original question I, you have you heard about this bet about some poker player named jeff made 10 years ago no okay so basically so this jeff guy he so first of all he was you know i I don't know Jeff, but uh, my roommate Aaron was one of the guys who bet against Jeff. He was some, uh, he was like an ex-Marines guy, but I think he was, you know, sort of an out of shape ex-Marines. You know, maybe when he was in the Marines, he was in better shape. Is, is kind of the vibe I get and a good bit heavier. He made a bet on, he had 24 hours and he had to, I think he had to do 4,000 push-ups, drink 24 beers and do eight shots. And, and, you know, 18 hours in or 19 hours in, he was above pace on the push-ups, 
but then just got too drunk and passed out. You know, I think he was, I think he had done 3,300 push-ups and had 19 beers and three shots or something, something like that, where it was just, you know, it was, it's just one of those things where, you know, it was, it was so much, you know, bigger of a bet or whatnot. And then also the guy was probably in worse shape than Bales was that when, you know, when Aaron saw this, you know, Aaron saw this guy firsthand go and try doing his 4,000 pushups or whatnot, uh, while probably weighing, you know, 50 pounds more than Bales does or whatnot. We, we just kind of thought, you know, okay, this, this just feels like Bales will win. So we were, we were speculating that that might've been the origin of the bet, but I guess, I guess it's not. What was, no. what was the origin of how this one came about? No, it was just uh, DFS players just uh, talking on uh, on Twitter, saying how many push-ups do you think you could do if if uh, you got you know five dollars or whatever it was for every push-up, and people were throwing out ridiculous numbers, and you know somebody said twenty four hundred, I think Peter said twenty four hundred, and people said no way, and and Bales just said I'll do it, and then immediately like people don't think for they don't even like think they just think like I can't do twenty four hundred anywhere <laughs> close. That means Bales can't do twenty four hundred, you know. And they, like, they didn't think, like, he'd have a plan and, like, he'd be able to execute the plan. Like, you know, so, so yeah, I, I was um, – I agree with you. I, I think Bales has more gamble in him than, than you think, but I agree with you that, you know, he's going to try to get it in good. I, I mean, obviously. I mean, everybody's trying yeah. to get it in good all the time. Yeah, yeah and most guys who get, end up in bets like this, if they're the type that gets it in bad – you'd have at least, you know, three or four stories of, haha, remember when he did this? Remember when he did that yeah. or whatnot? Well, so. some people pointed to, we did a, a one-mile race. It was me, Brandon Adams, and Bales did a one-mile race. And Bales actually quit halfway through because he was oh, like, shit. so that's why people are pointing to. But people don't realize, like, you know, Bales, like, uh, can't, uh, his cardio and his running ability distance is not uh, his strength. It's obviously in the, in the physical fitness stuff, um, right. strength stuff, so. So yeah, but yeah, I mean, people pointed to that, just don't understand Darius routine doing push-ups and, and running a mile. But yeah, him quitting that race, I think got him a lot of action on this, I would say. How did you guys each do in the one mile race, by the way? Who won? Yeah, so we, we did two. For, first uh, in Orlando, maybe like four, four years ago, I just ran heads up against Bales and I beat him by like maybe 10 seconds. Okay. And then of course, after Brandon Adams saw that, he was like, oh, I'll bet you guys. And we're so dumb. We were like, <laughs> oh yeah, well, you know, he obviously knew he could ice us, so. Brandon's like 40 something years old and got out there and ran a five, five thirty three, I think. Okay. Um, and I think I ran of, like, I ran like six eighteen, and Bales quit halfway through. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I can understand quitting, especially like, was there any prize for second? Like did you guys have well, a heads and, up yeah. with him? Yeah. Me and Bales had a side, a, a bet on the side. Yeah. Just me against him, but he still quit. So, yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, okay, gotcha. Because if it was just against Brandon, you know, 200 meters in, you're thinking, well, fuck, this guy, <laughs> you know, this guy can jog 200 meters fast and you can sprint it or whatnot. Yeah, so, okay, right. that's, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, no, definitely, that, that's a that's a fun bet. Yeah, Brand, you know, just looking at the three of you guys, I would just think, oh, Brandon, he's the running bill. He's the long distance running build kind of thing. Obviously, but, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I totally thought you were going to say he ran, you know, a 440 or something like that. Okay, so yeah. it's it's still an amount that, it's still a time that he wasn't, you know, if you guys ran like crazy, you could have upset him or whatnot, but okay, yeah. it's still a fucking fast mile. Maybe. I don't know if I'm capable of running a 530 at this point in my life, but I don't know. Um, anyways, on, on poker shares, I'm curious what, what your day-to-day is like. It sounds like you just sit around making lines all day. I mean, is that is that fair? Uh, is there a lot of day-to-day work for, for you to do? I mean, what's it like? Yeah, um, basically, no. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the, so these days, you know, I think with, um, you know, since we've expa- been expanding the number of products we've been offering it's been busier you know 2020 has been busier than 2019 um where you know we we originally were just so focused on you know on poker and then we just decided okay you know let's you know add these politics markets where and the reason for adding politics markets was basically just we wanted to bet on politics markets and we sort of realized that everywhere else is kind of shit Mm -hmm. i mean the, the one thing i will say is uh ftx is pretty awesome. If you use the cryptocurrency exchange FTX, they have, you know, uh, I think a great model there. Uh, but they, I think, I think they launched after, after we did. Um, and also they ban every country, you know, they ban Canada, America, EU, UK, Hong Kong, Singapore, like basically anyone who would want to use their markets is banned. Um, but basically, yeah, I was looking around, you know, Betfair Canadians aren't allowed to use 
predict it has a max bet of 800 bucks and they take something like a 10% cash out fee. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, you know, nothing really seemed to make that much sense. So we just figured, Hey, we'll do this ourselves and realize, Hey, we're getting a lot of traffic doing that. You know, we recently added dice and we're going to be adding a full casino. Um, and you know, that's been, you know, I think during quarantine, everyone's bored and <laughs> that's been picking up. And then we've been adding a wider variety of things within poker and just kind of, you know, random, um, random prop bets. There's a big, uh, there's a big chess match going on where a, a pretty good chess player is playing against, you know, one of the world's best engines, but the, uh, the engine gets one less night than it normally starts with. I think that starts tonight. We might, uh, throw up a line for that, you know, just throwing up random stuff where once you get, once you get out of the mentality of needing to make good bets, you know, <laughs> if you come in, if you come in and you think, okay, I want to handicap this properly, you know, you kind of have this emotional response where, you know, you make a $500 bet and if you win 5%, you know, 5% ROI, 25 bucks, it feels good. But then if you lose 25%, you know, lose 5%, lose 25 bucks, you just feel kind of stupid and you feel more stupid losing that than you do smart winning it. But kind of once you get over that hurdle and realize, hey, if you make one good bet, one bad bet, it washes itself out, you feel more comfortable just kind of uh, handicapping anything and, and realizing that it doesn't matter that much and you know okay maybe you know maybe you, you put up this market and all in all you do a bad enough job that the handicapping costs you know you get ten thousand in bets losing an average of three percent you cost three hundred bucks but then one guy goes and plays dice and because he 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 saw this was interested and donks off five hundred bucks at dice you know so the, there's definitely there's definitely a lot of uh you know, once you get past the mentality of feeling, okay, bets need to be good bets, it's pretty easy to just kind of throw up lines for whatever. So I guess, I guess what I was going to say is throughout 2016, 2017, spent a ton, a ton, a ton of time handicapping things, but then a lot of, you know, then you just kind of save your records, you see what's Mm -hmm. happened, you know, adjust them, you know, kind of manually adjust how you evaluate players. And then you can often just, you know, you kind of build this kind of system that works and then, you know, it's replicable. You know, if you're, if you're one price on the Sunday million last week, you're probably the same price this week. So, you know, there's, you know, there's a decent amount of time spent, you know, random data entry and whatnot. But as far as actually thinking about odds, you know, it's, it's mostly just kind of our, our new markets. And with a lot of these things, you know, we throw, we throw up a market on the Bales push-up challenge, you know, in my head, you know, he's just going to win. <laughs> but like, we basically just, let, we, we just let the, you know, we just let the market dictate where, okay, we put up one, one set of odds, someone bets one side, you know, move it in that direction. Someone bets that same set again, move it further. And, you know, just kind of, you know, and just kind of let, let the behavior of users dictate how things get priced. And, you know, eventually it'll reach a price where you have people interested in both sides. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, you just kind of go from there. Um, yeah. So I, I guess, I guess a lot of it just, you know, you start out, you, you have your limits be kind of low and you just kind of, you just kind of feel it out. You accept that, you know, the first few hundred or first few thousand dollars bet on a market, you're probably losing, but it doesn't really matter. Cause it's almost like, you know, those, those first guys who bet a market, they're almost like working for you for not that much money. You know, say, right. say the, you know, say we, we start out with the bales. I think we start with the 200 euro max bet on the bales challenge. You know, the first guy who places a 200 euro bet, if he's sharp, maybe his average ROI is 15 bucks or 15%. Okay. So he makes, he makes 30 bucks off of us. And now we have that information from a sharp. Okay. Now the next sharp only makes 12 bucks or something, you know, and, and yeah. just kind of, so, so basically um, I, I guess I, I, I kind of uh, uh, rambled on a little bit there, but so we, we spend a moderate amount of time, but it's not as, it's not as time consuming as you might think when your customer base does a lot of the odds making. Yeah. Party. Well, that's the thing. That's why, like, you know, professional bettors and big syndicates get so pissed off at their, uh, I guess, uh, not competitors, but other syndicates who are betting into uh, low liquid markets when, you know, when an NFL uh, line goes up and, you know, the max is only $1,000 and then people are betting into that. Well, it messes it up for everybody else. Everybody else is waiting for limits to get up to 10K or whatever before they start betting. So, you know, I I feel like a lot of the professional sports bettors are uh, pissed off at, uh, for whatever uh, people betting into lower limits uh, because of exactly what Mike just said, that um, it sets the market for them and allows the book to not do that much work if you're betting into really low limits uh, early in the week or when, an, or when a bet first opens. Um, yeah, okay. no, the, yeah that, that, that's a great example right there. And it kind of makes, yeah, it's, it's, um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's kind of, yeah, it kind of, it, it makes sense that so much of the, you know, so many good sports bettors get kind of, you know, congregated into a small number of pools or whatnot, where it kind of makes sense to collude against sports books a little bit, I guess. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, I think there's a, a, a good bit of that that goes on. And yeah, I've, I don't really have, um, I, I, honestly, for, for kind of how involved I am in the gambling industry, I don't have that many contacts to guys who actually do the handicapping within these, you know, more major books, but, you know, see, like, just kind of looking over their short shoulder, kind of job shadowing, you know, traders at the, you know, more, you know, legitimate <laughs> versions of our business is something that kind of interests me a little bit. Cause I wonder how sharp these guys are in the inside, how, you know, cause you know, you always hear about these, you know, sharp sports betters on the outside. And I wonder how sharp the guys are, you know, inside of Betfair, inside of Bet365, inside of Pinnacle, where, you know, yeah. I, it, it's, yeah, it, 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 inter- it interests me a fair bit where, um, you know, where it's, yeah, it seems like, it, it seems like it should be tougher for pro sports bettors to get an edge than it is. But I guess, you know, it's pretty likely that all the sharpest guys just don't work for these companies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think so. like the places like Pinnacle and Chris, I'm sure the guys behind the scenes there are very sharp. I, I assume that, you know, when people think about, um, you know, kind of donkeys, it's, it's, it's a lot of the guys that are just copying Pinnacle and Chris lines and stuff like that. Anyways, I, 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 can you guys ever get into the United States? I mean, uh, we know that um, or most people listen to this are in the United States. How difficult is it to get into the United States? And, and I'm curious uh, how, uh, if at all, your life has changed since the repeal of PASPA and and what's going on in the states right now with sports gambling yeah so i think that um yeah i mean i think the avenue for us getting into the states is the the sensible one is likely kind of a a partnership or acquisition i think you know i think we're we're still small enough scale that i don't think it um i don't think it makes sense for you know us to do the lobbying us to go through the hassle of getting into every state you know i think i mean i really think what i mean Again, it's it's one of those things where if we were five or ten times as big as we are right now, it might make more sense. But I mean, I really think that you know whoever is whoever is in charge of you know the MGM sports book or whatnot should probably just buy us. <laughs> where, you know, it's just you know it's just one of those things where I, you know I just I I gar- you know I just guarantee you you know if if you're one of those guys out there running those you know multi billion or tens of billion dollar sports books, I guarantee you know the price that poker shares would sell for and the price that we would be worth to your business, you know, you could probably pay itself off within a year kind of thing where it's just like, you know, we have, we have this amount we're making, you know, we're making pretty, you know, we're making pretty decent money on our own. And I think that, you know, I think that someone who were to just, you know, get us, get us in every Las Vegas casino could be making, you know, 30 times what we are kind of thing. And you know, sell at a t- you know, but a lot of the stuff you're offering is not even allowed to be offered in the United States, right? Like, why would MGM want to buy you? They can't put up the bales, push up proper politics and stuff like that. So, so, I mean, I'm saying as far as our kind of IP for handicapping poker tournaments alone, if yeah. every time you step into the Rio, you know, you're going there, you want to play this, you know, $10,000 tournament, but you've only got two grand. Okay, you look at the board in the Rio and you see you see, oh, I can buy a piece of Hellmuth, I can buy a piece of Negrano. You know, I think there's, I think there's you know, a lot of guys – you know, they're, they're playing in Bobby's room when, you know, they're a, they're a triple draw player. They don't even play the triple draw event because the, the action is so big in Bobby's room. Well, if you, if you look on the board outside Bobby's room and see, oh, I can buy 200% of this guy who's a student of mine. Okay. I'll get a sweat kind of thing. You know, I think there's, I think there's just so much, you know, during WSOP time, I think that, you know, if you look at the amount of side action that goes on during these things, I think it's absolutely crazy. And I think if, you know, if rather than, you know, rather than um, people being like, okay, you know, have their, have their friend who's not in America, you know, message me and ask about prices, you know, it, whatever the, you know, whatever the, um, you know, the, the number of kind of um, steps associated is so much larger. Whereas if people could just, you know, go look up at the, uh, you know, go look up at the board, you know, whether it's you walk into the Rio, you walk into Bellagio or whatnot, and just see those lines there the way you do with other things in the sports book, I think it would, um, yeah, just make uh, so much sense. And yeah, I, I, as far as things like the Bales push a bet, I don't know the legality of that within Las Vegas. Um, I guess that you know, it's it's probably one it's probably one of those things that 
I mean, if it isn't legal, it could one day. And also to a big company, I don't think that many guys step into Bellagio and think I want to bet on this. I think this is a niche thing where it's, you know, I think things like our poker markets scale much more effectively than something like that. Um, you know, if you were, if you were to get something really big, you know, say you had like a, a Donald Trump pushup challenge. Okay. Maybe you could get a hundred million. <laughs> you could maybe get a hundred million in bets on that kind of thing. But I think that, I think just kind of, a, you know, most people who step into a casino have no idea who Bales is. And then, yeah, no, of course. Oh, yeah. but, of course. But so, yeah, um, basically I, I think that, I, I think it's reasonably likely at some stage, you know, we just end up in some spot where, you know, we get like someone, you know, someone, someone acquires us they end up with some percent of the company they've already done they've already done all of the all of the work to figure out you know how to how to operate properly in america you know they use our data and you know then you know i I think that that i think that's the avenue to us going in the states rather than us um doing it on our own yeah no that makes sense i i hope so i hope it works out uh, one day. Uh, I, now that you're there on the other side of the counter, though, I, I have to ask you, there's so much controversy about uh, the sites owe it to people to, to the players to keep the rake low. Uh, the sites owe it to the players to set up the games in a way that's reasonable for pros. You know, I know we've been through this with poker stars. Um, on DFS sites, the rake is uh, extremely high. Uh, sports betting, you know, almost every uh, shop is cutting winners off, reducing limits, if you beat them on props, if you beat them over a certain amount of time on, on anything, um, even straight bets. Um, so I'm curious what you think now that you're on the other side of the counter, do the sites owe it to anybody, to any of their users to keep the rake low, to let them keep betting and essentially to let them keep w- winning money uh, off the site? Okay. So yeah, basically um, I would say, so, uh, so I was I was doing a lot of DFS kind of late 2016, and I've done very little the last three years. Um, the one thing I could definitely get a feel for, you know, sort of three and a half, four years ago when I was doing some DFS, is I think that the DF in, DFS industry is a little bit, um, at the time, was a little bit backwards as far as, you know, I think they were almost doing the wrong things for their net withdrawers. Like at, at the end of the day, the, your business, you care about your net depositors, you know, you, you just kind of, you, you, and you know, you, you do have your net withdrawers. And I think that, um, I think that, you know, some of the things that the DFS sites were doing, you know, they add, you know, they add these kind of weird bonuses that, you know, the bonus is so good. It only appeals to pros or, you know, you get some, I don't know, some $40,000 bonus or something, or, you know, some amount of, you know, some amount of rate back that really just kind of, caters to pros in um in things that they'll uh be doing any they'll be doing anyways i think Mm -hmm. that i think that you yeah i mean i think that uh you know dfs has been yeah i think they've been smart i mean smart in like a tricky way i suppose about making making tournaments that are a bit misleading into you know you have you pay out a large percent of the field you pay a small percent to first and whatnot and you you build this you know even if the rake isn't that high you have other dynamics that kind of you know you you make some if everything else is twelve percent rake you make something that's eight or nine percent rake but it has a really unfavorable payout structure um, I don't know I th- I think there's I think there's kind of a lot of factors at hand but at the end of the day I think you you care the most about your um, the, the people that d- deposit. Um, I do think it's, you know, I do think there are things where it's important to be, um, you know, honest with your customers, you know, as with, as with what happened, you know, five years ago when poker stars, uh, eliminated supernova elite, you know, I think that was absolutely terrible. They fucked over people's livelihood. You know, I think it was something if they were transparent, Hey, two years from now, we're removing supernova elite. Don't go for it next year. You know, that I, then I think it's like fine, smart, probably good business to basically just, you know, give people the proper warning that, hey, you know, we used to have our business focused around net withdrawers. Now we're focusing more on net depositors. But, you know, the way they did it, pulling the rug out from under people was always awful. And I'm not sure if the DFS industry has has done much of that. But I, I think that, yeah, I think that, I think that what, what basically I think that the biggest issue is when, when DFS looks at their customer base, they see, or when a DFS company uh, looks at their customer base, they see such a small number of people are doing such a large percent of their volume. And it's easy to kind of think, okay, we really need to cater to those people. But say you take those, you know, say you take those, those 40 guys that make up, you know, 50% of a site's volume, 
if those 40 guys didn't exist, everyone else would get bled dry so much slower that everyone else's volume would go up kind mm-hmm. of thing. So, you know, if you, if you kind of have this ecosystem of kind of low volatility con- contests where people kind of pass their money back and forth, back and forth, you know, the, at the, at the, you'll just have these kind of more bad players have good runs and whatnot. And these guys, you know, if you have, if you have someone who, you know, they, uh, they rake a million dollars a year and they cash out a million dollars a year, you know, that's, yes, they took a million dollars in rake, but really they took $2 million of deposits basically. And they kept half of it. So you, you kind of, you know, you, you want to kind of, you know, build things in a way that, um, that most of the money goes to the house, I suppose. And, you know, I think that, you know, again, I, it maybe things have changed, but I think that, you know, basically I think that at the end of the day, there's, uh, I think DFS is one of the funnest gambling products there is. And I think that th- it would absolutely be you, you know, people buy lottery tickets when there's no intention to profit and, and there's no ability to long-term profit. And I think DFS is way more fun than lotteries. And so I think that the DFS industry can survive without professionals because it's such a good gambling product. I think it doesn't really require uh, professionals for the ecosystem to sustain itself. Sure. And yeah, I mean, We've seen that, and Mike's obviously referring to things like, you know, the Millie Maker on NFL Sundays and stuff like that, these small buy-in, large payout tournaments that are raked at 15 16%. You know, I've talked plenty about how if you're trying to grind, like, that tournament's not for you. I mean, if you're really trying to grind and win, uh, that tournament's not for you. And then, but the same token, you know, I, I totally get it when people say, and I, I totally agree with them, that, like, trying to turn, you know, say they want to play $200, trying to turn 200 into 180 playing cash on Sunday is not fun. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not. And I get that. Like, it's fun for me because I'm like sick, but it's not fun for, for most people, you know, so I get it. But I wanted to ask about the sports betting thing about cutting people off because it's so controversial. And like, I, I've talked about how I think so much of this stuff is aspirational, right? Like in poker, people want to be the next Mike McDonald. They want to be the next Doug Polk or whatever. And they try and they work hard and they play a ton to try to get there. And um, with fantasy, you know, the same thing. They want to be the next Peter Jennings or Empire or, or whatever. And then in sports betting, it's like, yeah, I want to be the next Rufus or whoever the best sports better is, but I can't even do it because uh, everybody just cuts me off. As soon as I start winning, everybody just cuts me off. I, isn't that a problem for sports books or are they allowed to just, is it okay for them to just tell everybody uh, who wins to tell them to go fuck themselves? Your limit is now $50. Yeah, I guess that's, that, that's something that kind of, um, it, it, it irks me, I suppose. And I think it's something that um, I don't think it will. Uh, I don't think the future of sports betting involves that market or it's not, not that market, that model. Um, you know, I think that, I think the future of sports betting involves. So here, here's, so when I was talking about uh, FTX's uh, politics markets, I think if, you know if if you look at FTX's politic markets and apply that model to sports betting, I think that's the future of sports betting right there, where it's mostly it's mostly peer to peer, and you compete based on fees, and you know you have you have this thing where everyone everyone within the um, everyone within the community is kind of betting against each other at all times. Yeah. The line gets set by professionals rather than the book and rather than the book charging, you know, this three, 4% premium, you have pros charging, you know, half percent, quarter percent premium or whatnot. And you, you just kind of accept that, Hey, the, the site is their commission is 90% less, but their volume will be, you know, 3000% more or something because they allow everyone, they allow unlimited limits and basically just, you know, kind of trade, allow people to trade everything and and so i think i think it's i think we're sort of um i think the sports the sports betting the sports book model is a little bit um i i think effectively what you have is you know at its at its core is you have you have this sort of this customer base of vips that you make your you make your living off you kind of know their behaviors you sort of know oh they always like you know, they always like betting on the home team, or, you know, whatever. And you kind of allow them to bet what they want for large limits. And then you kind of make it seem like it's this open ecosystem. Right. But if people that would want those, you know, would actually want those limits, 70% of them are professionals rather than VIP. So ban, 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 ban. And then you keep, you keep that open and you kind of, you know, you, you massage this uh, user base of VIPs. And I think that that works right now in like a, 
semi-technological era, but I think as I think as technology gets better, as competition gets stiffer, there'll be more room that you know all these VIPs realize that you know they're they're getting such a better price if they go anywhere else. And I think that yeah, I think as time comes on, you'll have more kind of more books that you know operate like a um, an exchange operate like an exchange. And I think you know one of the issues that that limits that limits this is you pay you know you pay so much to payment processors. Um, payment processors like they eat up crazy margins uh, mm-hmm. in this industry, and I think that I think what'll end up happening is you'll end up having like one more competition amongst payment processors, and two things like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that can almost eliminate all fees altogether. And so I think you know I, I think that as as time goes on, there'll be more room to kind of transact sportsbook to sportsbook with lower fees, and then when the sportsbook takes on lower fees, the sportsbook can then give lower you know. Uh, can take tighter margins. And, you know, I think this, this kind of cycle can sort of repeat itself to where we have kind of a more competitive ecosystem that's fairer to pros. So, you know, I, I, you know that might take eight years or something like that, but I don't, I, don't see, I don't see sports betting in 2030 as being the same way it is in 2020. I think, I think, it's, I think the yeah. guys that, that kind of have this model of try to figure out who's sharp or whatnot, you know, it's, it's this constant cat and mouse game where you just need to you dedicate so many resources to figuring out who's sharp. A lot of sports books, they cut off, they cut off their whales because the whale just gets lucky a few times, and yeah. it, and it's 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 you know if and it's it's a it's a horrible model, and I think that that will uh, I think that will go away, but it'll just take time. Yeah, I, I agree that it's a horrible model. I don't th- I think ten years might even be optimistic to find a new model though, because over the next ten years, I feel like sports books are not spending their time and money innovating towards new models like exchanges. They're spending it lobbying in every state to try to get everywhere legal and it's just not like they're making money right now it's just not like at the front of their mind to have a better system but i hope that you're right one day and you know we're obviously like literally just birthed legal sports betting in the united states like you know before we die i think it'll be way 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 different hopefully um yeah oh i want you mentioned uh your time playing dfs Uh, i'm curious uh you say how fun it is why did you play so shortly and what was your experience uh playing dfs like how long did you play for and, and what sports and, and what was it like and why don't you play anymore yeah so i mean the, the the biggest reason i don't play anymore is uh poker shares launching you know so as i got into dfs when i mentioned i stopped playing poker late 20 or mid 2016 i kind of started the 2016 football season and then once um once uh Poker shares launched in January 2017. I just felt like I had kind of too many things on my plate to be doing the work necessary to, you know, prepare for NFL Sunday and whatnot. Um, yeah, so I, th- I think the biggest thing was just kind of too many things going on. I also, I was playing a good amount of golf back then, and I would always do, you know, golf DFS. I think I was a huge, you know, I probably lost, I don't know, 60K at golf DFS or something like that. But it was, you know, I, I just found it so much fun. Uh, I was a decent sweat. I, I I thought it was such a good sweat, and I barely ever had mm-hmm. any success at it or whatnot. Um, I went to I went to one live final. I think I went to the twenty sixteen season uh, FanDuel live final in California. Uh, that was that was sick. Um, but yeah, I, I just I, I I just enjoyed it quite a bit. It was definitely the most I've ever paid attention to sports since I was a kid. And yeah, I just I thought it was a, a tremendous you know gambling product, but I just. Uh, just kind of got too busy with other things. And I, I'm just someone, you know, similar with this, with this free throw thing and why I'm optimistic about it. I'm just someone, you know, I, I give things like a hundred percent or zero percent kind of, and, you know, I'm, I'm not someone who's going to come in and, you know, three Sundays a year, bet a couple K throw in some millionaire maker teams. Like I, I either want to be in, you know, every contest or I want to be, you know, just not paying attention. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. Okay. We'll get to the free throw bet in a second here. Uh, the uh, last thing I want to talk to you about before the free throw bet is will the NFL season happen? As a man who sets lines uh, all the time, what price are you willing to give me? And we've had some behind the scenes negotiations about this, but what price would you be willing to give me now that the NFL season will play this year? And there's, there's two different questions here. There's one, will they kick off as scheduled? I believe it's September 13th. Or will they kick off in the calendar year 2020? I think there's two different questions there. But let's first start with, do you think they'll play at all in 2020? And what do you think the line is there? Um, yeah, I guess I think they probably will. I mean, I have, I have no idea what the uh, – yeah, I have no idea what the overall line is. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it, 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 seems, it, seems like it's a fav- it seems like it's a pretty big favorite that some amount of NFL happens. You know, even if well, it's how, is it, how would you think about like, just when you get a, a question like this, how do you even think about how to make a line on something like this? I mean, you just, you know, it, it, like it's, it's not as if you could just plug something into some calculator or anything like that. Like a right. lot of it is just, you know, speculating on, you know, on how this disease progresses. And, you know, it seems like it seems like the last week has been somewhat favorable, I suppose. You know, it seems I mean, that sounds bad. Um, but you know, the growth isn't nearly as quick as it was three weeks ago kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're seeing, you know, thing you're seeing numbers in most of the countries that have been hit pretty hard are kind of stagnating, dropping, et cetera. So that's, you know, at least a, a sign in the right direction. And then the, uh, the other idea is that, you know, it used to seem so unfathomable to have pro sports with no fans or whatnot, but you know, it's, it, it's, it's much more, it's much more feasible now. And I, I think especially, um, you know, football, I guess it's, it's a little bit tricky when teams are so big, but especially, you know, especially something like basketball where you have, you know, a pretty small team, it's not that hard to just, you know, just have something along the lines of, um, you know, one, say, you know, one of these hotels that isn't being used, just everyone kind of goes and just sort of lives, lives in that hotel. You know, ev- everybody is quarantined where you just have some ecosystem. You have, yeah. you know, 500 people in there. You know, you have, you know, the maids don't leave the hotel. You know, what? like find some way of just kind of exposing, exposing no, like no one, I guess. Um, I don't know. I, th- I think that, but at football, it's tricky where you just have such, such a big coaching staff, such a big, you know, roster. You have so many people involved that it seems tough to, keep. you know, this, this thing isn't going away. Um, and you kind of, you sort of just, I think you just kind of need good testing, get tested once a week, et cetera. And test anyone who has like a, their temperature increased or whatnot, but you, you know, it's, it's tough to, um, it's tough to, you know, this thing isn't going to get eliminated anytime soon. It could totally drop by 95%. But I think that, yeah, I don't know. I think we're kind of going to go through these sort of like boom bust cycles for the next year or whatnot. And I think that, I think that there's probably enough room, you know, as each month that passes, we have a better understanding on, you know, on the disease itself, on how it spreads, the magnitude of it. And, you know, I, I would guess right now they'll, you know, there's kind of so much money in the NFL that I think, and it, you know, it doesn't require, it doesn't require that many people to make a large percent of the money. Like, let's say, let's say between all, let's say between all stadiums, between all organizations, et cetera, I don't know, maybe the NFL employs a hundred thousand people or, you know, something like that. It's like, you can probably have, you know, half the revenue employing 10,000 people or, you know, something like that um, where, you know, it's kind of, uh, there's, yeah, it just feels like there's, there's some variation of it that would probably work. So I I would just guess it's a bit, a big favorite to happen. Um, But yeah, for sure. So give me five to one against. Five to one against it happening. Yeah. Mm, I, I don't I don't know about that. I, 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 don't know that <laughs> I don't know if it's that big, I don't know if it's that big of a favorite. Uh, All right. we'll, we'll see. We'll um, see. Let's get to the the topic at at hand here. Um, on the heels of Bale's free throw bet, you posted a video of you shooting free throws, looking like someone who has never touched a basketball in their entire life. Didn't even know you're not supposed to jump on a free throw. I mean, looked completely egregious. Although I will say, you did get for someone who. Uh, obviously has never played basketball or, or whatever you did get reasonable backspin on your on your shot which is something that uh you know is important when you're trying to shoot but anyways i guess a lot of people made fun of you and i guess that prompted you to say i at some point in 2020 i will bet that i can make 90 out of 100 is that how this bet started um and can you confirm that your basketball background yeah, so basically we watched the we watched the Bales push a bet and just thought that was pretty cool. So then I started talking to Aaron about how many uh, how many free throws he thinks I could sink in an hour or whatnot. Um, and you know we were yeah we set the line at two fifty, um, and then you know we just yeah bet on whether I could sink more than two fifty in an hour. Um, I think yeah I sunk two seventy nine I think it was, and that was uh, you know I, I was kind of picturing you know. 450 shots sink 55 percent you know something like that but it was probably like 650 maybe 700 shots sinking like low 40s 40 percent um so you know fatigue was a big thing and whatnot um and yeah i guess i just 
uh, yeah, those, those were not so pretty. And, you know, people kind of, you know, Aaron just like put up a video to troll me and people were kind of like laughing, laughing at the form. And like some people were just saying some shit that was straight up mean. And I was, you know, <laughs> and I was just, you know, I don't know, I guess, I guess I'm just someone who, um, you know, I'm just, I, I, I guess I'm just someone who sort of thinks that, you know, if you're, if you're decent at something that you've, like put effort into and you're worse than other people who have put the same amount of effort you're you know, you're not someone who should be critiquing people and i just kind of you know I, I kind of put that out there as a hey you know you've played you know you guys have played pickup basketball on and off for a decade you know i think i could be a better shooter than you guys in less than a year you know just as to these kind of you know uh to these you know keyboard warriors who just think that you know who think that i suck yeah i suck but I'm just over here saying, you know, I think I could probably become, you know, a top couple percent shooter uh, without like, basically I'm just saying, I don't think it's that difficult. And I don't think people should be that proud of themselves that they're better, <laughs> that they're better at shooting a basketball than a guy who's never shot a basketball before. So it's kind right. of like a kind of like, and you know, I, I'm also in a spot where, you know, I've got, I've got a decent amount of like free time during quarantine and can't do that many things and just sort of, you know, I'm, I'm at around my peak weight I've ever been. Wouldn't mind losing 15, 20 pounds kind of thing. And just thought, hey, just sort of something to kind of, you know, get in, get in a bit of a rhythm, just have a part of my daily routine involve some degree of exercise, just sort of, yeah, it yeah. just kind of seemed to make sense. Well, free throw shooting, I would argue, is not that great of exercise, right? It's not like you're actually playing basketball. I mean, it's not. <laughs> well, I mean, I, but I mean, if I if you compare it to actual playing basketball, I don't know if that's such great exercise if you're just going to get coronavirus. You know, it's just, you know, this this is you know, as far as as far as something that's as far as something that's not gonna you know fuck with my lungs and land me in a hospital, this seems seems like an okay option. But you no, know, I, I do agree that it's it, it it's this is like you know, on the scale of exercises, it's probably like C minus or D plus or whatnot, but you yeah. know, it's, it's better than my, just sit on sure. my ass all day, every day. Better than nothing. So the parameters yeah. you tweeted out, you're going to have to get your own rebound, which I do think makes a big difference because you know, a lot of shooting is getting into a rhythm. So you're going to have to get your own rebound. And I want to be clear for people though, like everybody is like, I don't know if people just read too quickly or they don't think, but like the immediately if people see that you have to make 90 out of a hundred. And they immediately go to the NBA stats. And they look at all the guys who shot over 90% for the year. And they don't realize that, like, he's going to have unlimited chances at this. He could shoot hundreds of thousands of free throws before this is over to have one streak of 90 out of 100. Of course, uh, you know, a ton of NBA players, if they have uh, unlimited chances, no pressure, uh, can, guys who are shooting way below 90%. Uh, are going to have a streak where they make 90 out of 100. It's just a very different question. So, so many donkeys are just like, oh my God, 90 out of 100, that's impossible. Um, so yeah, I think that's one thing. The line has swung wildly here. At first, I think nobody thought you could do it. Now, uh, I think a lot more people are realizing that you probably can do it or you might be able to do it. I don't know. I, I really don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. I do have a number in my head that uh, Peter and and Bales and I have talked about that you would need to get to as a baseline in order to have a 90 out of 100 streak. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of are you capable of getting to that number uh, as a baseline. I'm sure you've thought about that as well. Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely one of those things where, yeah, if you're someone who shoots, you know, if you're someone who shoots 70% in game in the NBA, you know, so you're like a decently below average shooter, probably not like the worst shooter, but pretty bad, you can probably hit. 80% in practice. And if you can hit 80% in progress in practice, give yourself a hundred thousand shots, you can lock box, you know, a streak or whatnot. So it's, yeah, it's definitely not one of those things where I think I'd, you know, I don't think, I don't think I'm going to be a better shooter than Steph Curry by the end of this or anything, which is what I think a lot of people assume be a bet is the equivalent right. to. Um, yeah. I'm not, I'm not that uh, arrogant, uh, but it's, yeah, it's just kind of, um, yeah. So there, there's a decent, yeah, decent amount of variance. I, I think looking at the numbers, you know, if I become, a 75% shooter, I'm basically drawing dead. And if I become like a low 80s percent shooter, I'll hit it eventually kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, yeah, you know, it, it, it seems like that's, I mean, that, that's a pretty high goal where, you know, not a lot of players shoot over, you know, low 80s yeah. in game or whatnot. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, I think just kind of, you know, wanted to set, um, set something that seemed like it would be relatively relatively challenging but not impossible and then yeah i think a lot of people um yeah assume that kind of shooting in a game with like you know i i, I never go <laughs> i never go to uh i actually went to my first 
uh, basketball game since I was a kid. I think I went to one or two Raptors games with my uncle when I was, you know, 11 or 12. And then I went to, um, I probably went to the worst game that they've, that they played all, uh, all season. I went to the playoff game when they were playing the Sixers and the final score was, I don't know, 84, 77 or what, whatever was the lowest scoring playoff game where, you know, they lost, they lost at home to the Sixers and it was, you know, the Sixers probably played terrible and they played worse. So I, I, you know, I chose the worst game of the season to go to probably, but basically I didn't notice, I didn't really notice this. When people are shooting their free throws, you have these guys with these, with these fucking like clack, clapper things. Going yeah. Like, you know, they're making all this, these popping sounds. I hate sounds like that. Yeah. You know, they give them to everyone and you have, you have 500 people just distracting you. <laughs> it's like, I couldn't, I couldn't hit one out of a hundred of that. Just like, what the fuck, man? You know, you're a basketball fan. I'm a pro. Don't you want to see good basketball? Like, you know, what the, what the fuck is this? <laughs> so yeah, it's just, you know, if I, if I was over there, you know, if I was, you know, if I was, you know, Embiid or someone, I would, I would just be thinking like, come on guys, like, do we really have to do this? You know, so it's, you know, it's, it's so different. The idea of you just stand there, you get in a decent rhythm, you shoot it an inch short, you're like, okay, let's, let's shoot it 1% harder this time. Whereas there, you're just too busy by these fucking popping sounds, people screaming, sure. you know, drunk people spilling beer. I don't know. Yeah. It's such a, you know, you just got fouled. Maybe you're somewhat, maybe your kidney hurts right now. Maybe your Achilles hurts, you know, and you got to go shoot after someone, you know, just like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. It just seems cool. it's, it's apples to oranges. Well, yeah. And also one thing that I would note in your favor is like, even if you're not good at basketball, even if like, you're not that athletic, which I have no idea which, if either is true about you, but free throws isn't The first basketball. is definitely true. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I mean, free throw to me is more like bowling or, or golf or pool, right? It's not Darts. like an athlete. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, if you get the form down, you could in theory repeat it, you know, and there's a lot that can go wrong with a free throw, but if you get the form down, you could have a chance to just repeat it over and over again. Getting your own rebound, though, I think does make uh, a big difference. But anyways, it's interesting. Uh, it seems like you want to get a lot on yourself. It seems like you're accepting all customers. I think you asked for minimum 5K on Twitter and then on, on poker shares. You guys are accepting a bunch too. So uh, you obviously think you can do it. And obviously, um, you know, anytime somebody I think is uh, competent comes with these bets that uh, is like, one against air i you know like bales i can do the push-ups peter you know bet that he can make 70 college three-pointers or whatever like you know i'm hesitant i'm always hesitant to just be like oh this is too hard there's no way he can do it so i don't know i don't want to kill your action but that's no, just no, what i, I mean think. in these bets you know and i think most people on betting and still know this in these bets usually the guy who's betting they can do something usually ends up doing it kind of thing. Yeah. And then, you know, if you, if you find yourself being surprised, you know, I think, I think a lot of people would benefit from kind of keeping a log book of you see some challenge bet and record what you think will happen, record your predictions and then do this, you know, six or eight times and see how your predictions were. And then eventually you'll be like, Oh, these, like these guys succeed more than you expect. So, you know, I, I yeah. I'm definitely, you know, I've, I have high expectations for this. Um, and yeah, you, you commented about the line moving where it's, you know, I put the tweet out and all of a sudden, you know, I had 15 DMs, you know, every, it was, you know, it was, you know, I, I had, you know, quite a bit of action immediately. And then I just thought, well, you know, I shouldn't be doing this at one to one. I probably, you know, I figured, okay, I'll move to two to one and then three to one and then four to one. So I moved it to two to one and then, you know, kind of, action slowed down. I'm like, okay, 1.75 to 1, 1.5 to 1. You know, now we're, we're back at one to one. And, you know, it's, it's something where, you know, it's, it's nice to get kind of get laid a price, but I feel like everyone always gets anchored by the type of line movement. And I think it would be, maybe it would have been better to just go, okay, now I want 1.2, then we'll, you know, keep raising the line up rather yeah. than raise it so far up. But regardless, I, I just have no idea what the price on this should be. You know, I think I'm going to do it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm a so, horrendous shooter. So yeah, I, I don't know. What, well, one thing I would say, uh, this isn't a great sweat, right? It's not like the, it's not like uh, something that's, you know, you tune in and you get to watch and it's over. I mean, I'm just, if I bet against you, I'm just going to wake up one day and you're going to send me a video and be like, oh, there it is. Like, I'm not going to sit there and watch you shoot free throws on some live stream for the next, you know, 300 days or whatever. Right. So I think I mean, you uh, can, you know, you, it's, it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's like, I, I think for me, basically like what, what I'm thinking is, so let's just say I never get to a point where I think, I, you know, so, that, okay. I, I'd say there's kind of um, three plausible outcomes. The first is that, you know, I never become a halfway decent shooter and I lose the money basically. The second mm -hmm. is that I, I become a halfway decent shooter, but never a good shooter. And I think at that point, you know, maybe Saturday, December, I'll just, 
you know, start streaming every session and just hope to variance it. You know, if I'm, if I'm a 76, 77% shooter or whatnot, just throw in the live stream, hope to get lucky kind of thing. And then the other, the other situation is like, Hey, I'm progressing. I'm progressing. I haven't hit any plateaus. And then, you know, I become a pretty good shooter and then, you know, I'll throw, I'll throw on the stream and, you know, whenever that happens to be, whether that's September or November or whatever, uh, and then just start, start streaming and hopefully have it not be that long. You know, for me, basically if I, like, I, I don't, I don't mind the scenario where I get it unfilmed. Like I don't, first of all, I don't really want to go in public with this fucking virus. <laughs> Second of all, you know, I like just kind of, you know, practicing on our own hoop. I like the routine associated with there. You know, I think it's unlikely that, you know, in July I variance 90 out of a hundred and then I never hit it again for the rest of the year. You know, I, I just, right. I, I don't think that that's likely. So I don't mind if I, I don't mind if I kind of hit it in practice unfilmed. Um, because I think likely then I'll, I'll hit it again later. So, so basically I'm, I, I don't think I'll do that much filming until either it's a time crunch in which case it's interesting, or I think that I can, you know, hit it once every 50 hours or, you know, something like that, which is a right. bit interesting as well. So I, I think that, I think, so there, there is a scenario where I'm just like dead, like, and that would be like the 300 days of failures. And I think those scenarios, I just wouldn't even film it. But I think that once I'm filming, it's either time crunch or, plausible I could hit it kind of thing so I I would I would guess that you know I would guess you know if I do start you know I might do something like you know once a month throw up a stream just kind of show what my progress is like just kind of chat to people shoot for two three hours or something like that and then other than that and they just kind of know that I'll never get it maybe just track a new pb or whatnot and then other than that I think that once you know once I kind of start up a twitch stream I think it'd be more exciting than people would expect where you know, yeah, either there's not a lot of yeah. time or I'm getting some, you know, 85s, 87s, you know, things like that. Right. Yeah. No, it, it, I didn't realize it was going to be like that. If you were only going to stream for a couple of weeks, uh, that could be fun uh, for yeah, sure. The whole I year. Think. Like if you were to watch me right now, you know, yesterday, yesterday I shot a hundred and got 43. You know, it's, I don't think, I don't think anyone wants to hear me like, you know, yelling at myself as I think sync 43 kind of thing. So, right. so I, it's, yeah. I also got to ask you the, the video that you posted, I mean, that hoop did not look regulation way too loose on the rim and the ball yeah. did not look and the ball did not look inflated properly uh will we have a regulation hoop and rim for the bet yeah so that's so that's the other thing is so the, the ball's now properly inflated and i think the i think aaron might have adjusted the hoop a little bit but it's it's still not a regulation hoop and so basically i you know i'll practice i'll practice at my place maybe film myself you know practicing at my place but i'll use you know a proper hoop when this happens so you know I'm I'm a little bit uncertain where, you know, part of me kind of wants to, you know, give some updates tracking my progress, but also this rim probably adds 10%. You know, if I'm hitting, if I'm hitting 60 on this rim, maybe it's only 45 or 50 or, you know, there's some, Mm -hmm. there's some massive difference there. So, you know, what I was kind of thinking of doing, which is maybe decent, maybe it's, it's dumb is to just count how many swishes I get and just kind of, you know, a a swish is a swish kind of thing. Um, And so I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, maybe that should be the progress I track because then it doesn't really matter which rim I'm on. And then, you know, try to, you know, map, okay, 75 swishes is 90, you know, something like that to determine when I'm ready to go and actually uh, attempt this, I guess. So, sure. so you know, but yeah, basically the, the rim is, bu- the rim in that video is, is really bullshit. And, you know, I, I imagine that, you know, it, it's probably easier to hit 95 on this room than it is 90 on a real room kind of thing uh is your coach for this aaron jones ae jones because i know he fancies himself as like the kyle corver of the dfs community <laughs> uh yes i mean he's my roommate so you know he's definitely giving me advice you know people keep on talking about how i should get a coach and you know i think aaron takes that as a little bit of a shot to the ego i think you know <laughs> he could be a coach so it, it's 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 definitely one of those things where we'll yeah we'll see how things progress here um Hopefully, you know, hopefully I don't need to hire a coach, but you know, if, if it's not going well, if I'm getting a little tilted, you know, if, if we're, you know, if, if, if we stop talking to each other or whatnot, it's, uh, you know, maybe then I'll get a real coach. But for now, I think just uh, the Kyle Corver of uh, DFS will be, uh, will be my coach. Okay. Interesting bet. I don't know what side I'm going to take yet, but now that I've heard about how it's going to be a sweat at the end, I do want to take a side. So I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know which side yet though. I got to think about it more. Um, all right. Before we wrap up here, just a few quick listener questions. We'll go quickly through these. Uh, from Mahomes Goat 11 he says, ask Mike the odds we see the WSOP main event this year, which is a poker 
main event. This was interesting because I don't know if you got in on any of that 20 to one action, but I know there were actually people laying 20 to one that, and actually like not like dumb people, like, like sharp people, I think were like, there's no way they'll cancel WSIP main event. Um, I don't know what you think it is now. Uh, I don't know if you guys even have that up on poker shares or not. Will there be a world series of poker main event as scheduled this year at the Rio? Yeah, so I actually bet that I actually bet that line down a little bit, which is probably why he's expecting it. People put the lineup at twenty to one, and I was just thinking, man, this is you know maybe two to one or something. So you know, I bet it down to sixteen to one, then twelve to one, and got you know bet a little bit there, but not a lot. Um, and then and then you know we added up, up poker shares as maybe a three to one dog, then two and a half to one dog, and a two to one dog, and you know it and it got to I don't know maybe a three to one favorite not to happen. And then eventually we just took it off the board where we just kind of figured it's not going to happen. <laughs> and, you know, no, you know, nobody's betting it will happen. I mean, at this point, it's almost more interesting because I think, I think we're, you know, it seems to be getting handled reasonably well. And now I'm starting to think, Hey, maybe it could happen um, where it's, it's actually kind of getting closer to a real price. You know, maybe I, I would guess it's an underdog to happen, but you know, if I were to say, I'll say, I don't know. Um, 30% to happen maybe, but I, 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 have, I have no idea. It just seems like we're um, progressing in a less bad direction than I would have thought sure. a month ago. The problem with the World Series of Poker is, I mean, everybody from all over the world convening on one convention room just doesn't seem like a smart idea and sharing chips and sharing cards all day just seems like just a recipe for disaster. And, and the biggest thing which you leave out that a lot of people, a lot of DFS people might not realize is that, you know, poker players, especially poker players at the Rio, are the grimiest, most oh, disgusting yeah. people in the world. It's like, you know, I've seen shit, I've seen shit like guys sitting there with his hand down his pants, scratching his balls before throwing <laughs> out his ante. It's, you know, you, you see a guy, you see a guy, even sometimes even, you know, a known professional, you see him wearing the same t-shirt 15 days in a row. Just fuck it, you know, people stink. It's it's absolutely disgusting. Like I I, I think, you know, I, I would I would guess if you were to go around the Rio and ask, you know, run a poll and say like, what is hand sanitizer? <laughs> I don't know if you could find a single person who even knows what it is. So, I so know. it's, so it's, it's just, uh, you know, the, if it's totally possible, you know, right now you've got 400,000 cases in America, it's totally possible. You know, you get down to where there's 7,000 cases in America and those are the 7,000 people. Who show up. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so it's, I would, uh, it's, it's, it is. Yeah. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, probably all the people that would want to play that will already have the virus or maybe right. have built an immunity to the virus from spending yeah. so much time around such disgusting people. But yeah. basically it's, it, as much as I'm exaggerating, it's like a cesspool for germs. Right. Um, exactly. So yeah, it's, yeah. If, if, if there's some, even if it gets to a point where, you know, only one out of a hundred thousand people have it or whatnot, <laughs> you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm still afraid for, for yeah. the WSOP. Oh no, I would not be, I'm not, playing any live poker for the foreseeable future that's that's for sure and i actually enjoy you know the less i've played poker the more i enjoy you know playing a live session here and there and uh, but i'm definitely not playing anytime anytime soon um we went through this whole time without talking about crypto at all you got a question from suzu uh she or he said ask him if his legs ever got tired from taking well-deserved victory laps over ledger x being run by total enumerate frauds that sounds like a, a crypto topic way above our heads but you can you can do your inside joke with this if you want, but I'm more curious about how you got into crypto and 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 being in the gambling space. I think a lot of people in gambling just like fell ass backwards into crypto money because crypto was already being used to fund sports betting accounts, to fund poker accounts, and so if you had a bunch of it anyways and you were using it like um, as a utility, not using it as investment, then all of a sudden next thing you knew, like a year went by, and next thing you knew you were like rich from just having to having to have this. So. I'm curious what your initial experience with crypto was like and, and what the hell this, this question is about. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, talk, about my, I'll talk about my initial um, experience with crypto, I suppose. I had, um, yeah, so I had one friend who just kind of told me to go all in crypto back in 2013. You know, he put his whole net worth into crypto and was telling me to do the same. But he was just someone who was kind of always wrong about about investing or whatnot but i still kind of took it to heart that was when it was at you know 150 a coin or something um and then kind of late 2013 it had a run-up and uh jay rayner uh b by majeep started mm -hmm. kind of buying around that time and you know he convinced me to buy and you know i bought some amount of bitcoin i left it on an exchange and <laughs> you know the exchange got hacked exit scam whatever and i lost it 
Um, and so I told myself, you know, I'm never touching crypto again. But then I just had more people asking me, uh, you know, what I think of Bitcoin, you know, if I transact in Bitcoin, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, over, over enough time, I just kind of, you know, started researching more, kind of figured I'd give it a second chance, figured I'll actually protect my own keys this time around. It just kind of tried to be uh, a lot smarter about it. And then, yeah, just kind of, you know, late 2016 started getting, started getting kind of back into it, used as a way of, you know, you know, paying horses, settling up, you know, money that I owe people, you know, things like that. And, you know, so definitely an example of someone who's somewhat backed into it where I wasn't a huge believer in it, but it's just, you know, a useful tool where, you know, being able to send money without going to your bank or without paying currency conversion fees or, you know, anything like that. Um, yeah, so that was kind of how I got into it originally. And then, yeah, to the, to the original, to the tweet that someone sent you. So I think that's a fake, I saw that tweet. It's like a fake Suzu. Uh, Suzu is, you know, one of the kind of, you know, more more informed, I don't know, kind of fund managers within, uh, within the crypto space. I think this is someone like who copied his name, but basically there, there are these guys, uh, Ledger X who were kind of, they were one of the main, uh, they were one of the main platforms for buying options on Bitcoin. Um, and you know, their, you know, their, their team, you know, they're all MIT grads and they're all, you know, have, have these kind of impressive backgrounds, but like the, you know, the CEO just seems like this like massive sociopath who just, you know, definitely, you know, at some point, uh, his, you know, at some point, his wife, who's his co-founder said something where she just like massively fucked up the math. And then me and Jason, me and Jason Strasser kind of responded saying like, Hey, that's not like how option pricing works. You messed this up. And then he took it to be like, you're insulting my wife. And, you know, he, <laughs> he, he got, he got it, you know, and I, I, you know, I even, you know, I even like DM'd with her and she kind of like admitted, you know, the, the, the mistakes that she had made, but he got like so partially like, no one says anything ill of my wife and got really, really mad. And then, so we were talking about, we were talking about betting on this. You know, if you go back to like my tweets, I can kind of late, late June, early July or whatnot, you can see kind of, you know, me and Jason arguing back and forth with this guy. Um, and yeah, he, he just got super personal. We were offering to bet on, bet on things and he wouldn't put his money where his mouth is. You know, his, his bid ask spread on how he would price options was like 10,000%. Like he'd, he'd buy for $2, sell for $200 or something. You know, he's <laughs> totally unwilling to, you know, unwilling to be at all reasonable in this. And so, you know, we kind of heckled him back and forth. And then, you know, a few months ago, you know, oh, so may, then maybe six months ago, they got in some, um, they got in some uh, trouble, not with the SEC, with, with some other government organization where he, he basically uh, thought that his company could do something they wouldn't. And then he just started, you know, he just started like ranting at some, you know, government institution over, uh, over social media and just getting, you know, just being a totally insane person. You know, you're, you're some small 15 person company no one gives a fuck about. And you're over here, you know, acting like you're ready to take on Wall Street or whatnot. So, you know, then, so then they, you know, never... Um, you know, never approved any of the products his company wanted to offer. And then a few months ago, they forced him and his wife out of the company. Like they had to step off the board, like the company, you know, now other people are running his company and, you know, he's still ranting off, spouting off on social media. It's just, you know, and, and so it's just, and every once in a while, you know, when something bad happens to him, I'll go, I'll go and, you know, quote his tweets being like, cause, oh, cause he said he could, he said he couldn't put his money where his mouth is because he's the CEO of this company. The reason he couldn't bet on it is because he's CEO and he's not allowed to. And then, so I said, now that you're not CEO, would you be, would you want to bet your, bet your money where your mouth is? And so I think that's, I think that's why, you know, Suzu was asking if I'm, um, if my legs hurt from, you know, stomping over their corpses or whatnot, where it's just, right. you know, the initial argument, you know, the guy kind of made himself look pretty dumb. And then kind of as it's continued on and on, you know, it's kind of played out in a, I would say somewhat predictable fashion where, you know, when someone's kind of that overly self-confident and that kind of deluded in their own opinions and thinks, you know, they're right about everything, everyone else is wrong about everything, like usually things don't play out, I guess, for, for someone like that. And so, yeah, I guess we've kind of revisited that argument a couple of times. Uh, are you still uh, bullish on long-term outlook uh, for crypto as an investment, not as a utility, as an investment? Uh, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, long term, I, I just think this is, it's going to be huge. You know, I, I, I think, I think even, you know, if, if, if again, I've said this to a bunch of times, you know, if Bitcoin ends up, you know, half a million a coin, you know, I'll be completely unsurprised. You know, it's just, it's just, uh, I'm not saying it, I'm not definitely not saying it will, I'm not even saying it's likely, but I'm saying that the, uh, 
I'm saying it'll just, you know, for me, it'll be completely unsurprising if, uh, if Bitcoin ends up doing extremely well. So yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I think as far as, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm bearish on the economy in general for the next, you know, year. I'm bearish on, you know, this happening narrative that's going on. Uh, but in spite of that, you know, I'm still, you know, very kind of heavy in Bitcoin in spite of me thinking, you know, uh, there's a couple of things working against it. I, I just sort of think as, as time goes on, you know, people, you know, Bitcoin's scarce. The USD is getting, you know, trillions of USD are getting printed on a whim. It's possible that printing that USD leads to to print more USD. And, you know, I just think that, and, you know, this, who knows how subsequent waves of this virus end up being, who knows if, um, you know, if people with labs start kind of inventing pandemics as like a, you know, twice a decade occurrence, you know, you, you have, you have no idea what the future is, but you know, if we, if we end up in this spot where the, the solution, you know, I think, you know, I think, um, I think bioweapons will become more common. Um, and I think that, you know, not, not saying whether this is or not, but I think that, I, I think it, it's a kind of a logical thing that that will happen more in the next couple of decades. And if the government, you know, the government kind of needs to decide, um, you know, print money, let people die, you know, you, you need to figure, figure out something. And I think that, you know, I think that the printing presses won't really stop and owning something that, uh, is scarce seems, uh, pretty useful, I guess. Well, now, now you're scaring me. We, we need to get to the last question here. Okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Last question comes from Harms. He says, any specific info on what the person who names their kid after to name any specific info on what the person who names their kid Timex gets? I know my boy Landon Tice is very committed to doing it. I didn't see this. Have you offered people money to name their kid Timex? What is wrong with you? Um, I'm not sure. There was someone who had a piece of me in a tournament who said that they're going to name, uh, I think they said they were going to name their kid, you know, name their kid first name Mike, second and middle name McDonald or something. I'm not sure what, what he's referencing. Maybe. <coughs> yeah, basically it's totally possible at one point. I, I, I made a joke about that one time while streaming, but yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. Okay. Will you pay anyone to name their kid Timex then? Mm, I don't know. It just it doesn't seem like a very good name. <laughs> I don't know. No. I, I, yeah, probably probably not. I'm not condoning that. Okay, you said it all. Yeah. Big thanks to Mike for coming on. Mike, tell the people where they can find you, where they can bet with you, whatever, whatever. Yeah. So I mean, uh, Mike McDonald eight nine on Twitter. Um, it's kind of the social media I use the most. Um, the site that I'm associated with is Poker Shares, where you, know, you can bet on poker tournaments, bet on things going on in the world. We're going to add kind of, you know, there's not enough shit to bet on right now. And we just kind of want to allow people to bet on, you know, any kind of niche thing going on, whether it's, you know, challenges in DFS, potentially, you know, the outcome of some DFS tournaments, you know, things like that. Um, we're just kind of going to, you know, expand the, uh, the number of things that, uh, yeah, that we're doing. And yeah, I guess those are probably uh, the two main places to find me, I suppose. All right. Appreciate the time. Good luck in the free throw challenge. I do think, you need, I do think you need another coach, uh, A.E. Jones. I've seen him uh, shoot in Las Vegas, and, and he was no Kyle Korver. Okay. All right. Yeah. No, if, if, things, if things aren't progressing well, I might, <laughs> I might need to uh, – yeah, it's, it's a bad thing. You know, Aaron – I kind of assumed, you know, Aaron would, would want to bet on me. Like, I just figured he's my roommate. You know, he's giving advice. I kind of assumed he would want action on this but he doesn't, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> you know, I think he's, you know, one of, one of his buddies likes my side and, you know, I've been kind of, you know, I think Aaron almost wants to bet against his, butt. you know, it's, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what exactly is oh. going on, but it's a little, it's a little depressing when the, you know, when, yeah, when the person, you know, who's like giving you advice has no faith. So yeah, we'll see, uh, we'll see what happens there. Maybe I'll need, uh, maybe I'll need to find a coach who actually believes in me. Yeah. Tim Legler would be my, would be my recommendation. Great guy. Okay. Uh, all right. For Mike, for producer Luke, I am Adam. Good luck, everybody.